Hi, my name is Pamela Coons, Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Oncology at Yale School of Medicine and Yale Cancer Center. I'm excited to announce ASCO's new open access journal, JCO Oncology Advances. As the inaugural editor-in-chief, I hope to support JCO Oncology Advances to become the premier platform to bridge the gap between accessible scientific research and clinical care. Stay tuned for more information, including new article types, at ascopubs.org forward slash JCO Oncology Advances. We look forward to seeing your submissions in spring of 2024. Disclosures for this podcast are listed in the podcast page. Welcome to Oncology Etc., an ASCO education podcast. I'm Pat Lair, Director of Global Oncology and Health Equity at Indiana University. And I'm Dave Johnson, a medical oncologist at the University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas. If you're a regular listener to our podcast, welcome back. If you're new to Oncology Etc., the purpose of the podcast is to introduce our listeners to interesting and inspirational people and topics in and outside the world of oncology. Imagine knowing in your heart what you wanted to be in life. It usually takes people decades to figure that out, but our next guest knew at age three that she wanted to be a doctor and later in high school to be an oncologist. She's achieved much in her lifetime and has incorporated the pay it forward by mentoring many others. Our guest today is Edith Mitchell. I first met Edith over 40 years ago when we were both starting out our careers as junior faculty. She grew up in rural Tennessee, and as Pat mentioned remarkably, she chose a career in oncology at a very early age in high school, despite the fact that oncology was barely a specialty at that time and the lack of role models, particularly role models of color and women in particular. She received a Bachelor of Science degree in biochemistry with distinction from Tennessee State University and a medical degree from the Medical College of Virginia in Richmond. In 1973, while still attending medical school, Edith joined the Air Force, receiving a commission through the Health Profession Scholarship Program, and eventually rose to the rank of Brigadier General. She completed a residency in internal medicine at Meharry Medical College in Nashville and a fellowship in medical oncology at Georgetown University. Her research interests are broad and involve new drug evaluation, development of new therapeutic regimens, combined modality therapy strategies, patient selection criteria, and supportive care for patients with gastrointestinal malignancies. She is leader of the GI Oncology Program at Jefferson Medical College, director of the Center to Eliminate Cancer Disparities, and enterprise vice president for cancer disparities at Jefferson Sidney Kimmel Cancer Center. She's held a number of leadership positions, including those in ASCO, and she's a former president of the National Medical Association. I could go on forever. So, Edith, welcome, and thanks for joining us on Oncology, etc. And thank you so much for the invitation, Dave and Pat. It is a pleasure. You grew up on a farm, as I recall, in Tennessee. Perhaps you could tell us a little about your early life. I grew up on a farm that my great-grandfather's mother received about 1863 when the Emancipation Proclamation was made. I was the fifth child in my family. My parents were working. My older siblings were in school. So my great-grandparents were my babysitter. So I spent a lot of time with them. He was 89 at the time, became ill, and I overheard family members and neighbors say that they couldn't take him to the hospital because blacks were not treated properly in the hospital, so they were going to take care of him at home. A physician made a house call when he left. I told my great-grandfather, Pa, when I grow up, I'll be a doctor, just like Dr. Logan, and I'll make sure you get good health care. So at three years, I decided I would become a doctor, and I would make sure that Blacks received good health care. My work in disparities started when I was three. So after my sophomore year in high school, 
there was a National Science Foundation program in Memphis at Lamont Owen College. So I applied and was accepted. And part of the time in Memphis that year, we were given opportunities to go to St. Jude. So my time at St. Jude made the decision that I would become an oncologist. I became really fascinated by cancers and in pathology, use of the microscope and how cancers were all different, how they varied from the normal tissue for areas such as the colon or the stomach or the pancreas. It's amazing that, that, that early in your life you made that kind of decision. Can I back up just one moment? I, I want sure. to ask you briefly about the doctor that visited your, your great-grandfather, Dr. Logan. Dr. Logan was a family physician, African-American, and he had a great interest in Blacks being healthy. In fact, when polio vaccine was made public, Blacks could only go one day per week because you couldn't go the times when whites were there. Dr. Logan obtained vaccine and he would line the children up at his office. He gave me my first polio vaccine. He was a very handsome man, a three-year-old deciding. I was say, to you do that at age three, huh? <laughs> And, you know, David, I found out later that the medical school that he attended in Memphis was one of the ones closed as a result of the 1910 Flexner report. So he had to go to Meharry in Nashville and take other courses to maintain his license to practice medicine. Were you the first one to go into? medicine and, and tell me tell me about that background and how your family influenced you personally. Neither of my parents finished eighth grade, but they were very smart. They pushed their seven children to do well. They provided educational materials in our home and encouraged us to to work and to take advantage of opportunities. Let's move forward a little bit. I thought I knew a lot about you, Edith, but I didn't realize that you were a brigadier general. What was the motivation for joining the service in the 70s when you were at med school? Was it scholarship funding or was there just a patriotic zeal or a little of both? What, so what, what was that all about? my main objective was for financial reasons, a scholarship covering all expenses of medical school, plus a monthly stipend. When I was in medical school, one of my laboratory instructors told me about this new scholarship program. And I said, okay, I just want to graduate from medical school. So he says, well, I know people in the Surgeon General's office. I'll have them send you the information. He did, and I looked at it. And I didn't remember, David, that my husband filled out the application. And after my neurosciences final exam, I came home and he says, your commission came in the mail today. So I said, okay. So he says, well, I can swear you in. We can't do it at home because you have to have a witness. You take a nap, and then we're going out to job control, which was where all the aircraft controlled the control room. We went there. We've got a picture of the swearing in. And we then went to the officers club. It was Friday. And there were lots of people in his group from the Air Force Academy, from Citadel, Virginia Tech, and others. And they were all talking. Yeah, Edith got a mail order commission. <laughs> so so I owed the Air Force two years. 
And I practiced at Andrews Air Force Base, which was the presidential squadron. You hear the president always leaving Andrews Air Force Base. So I think I was 29, maybe, but I was young. And here I was taking care of senators and other important people in government. And these are people I'd only seen on TV before. So I had a really good experience. I received many accolades, but also many letters from people for whom I cared for. And I was therefore invited to stay on in the Air Force, either go to Walter Reed or to San Antonio. I said, no, I'm going to Georgetown. So one of the VIPs, if I mentioned his name, you would know, said and wrote a letter for me that the Air Force should give me whatever I wanted and whatever I needed to continue in the Air Force. So I received my Air Force pay while I was a fellow at Georgetown. And so I stayed on. I got promoted early and engaged in Air Force work. I loved it. And I did well in that atmosphere and stayed on. After my second child was born, I decided I could not continue active duty and take care of two kids. So I left the Air Force, went to the University of Missouri, and someone called me one day and said, you know, I hear you are at the University of Missouri now. Would you consider joining the National Guard? I went, joining the National Guard? Why would the National Guard want an oncologist? And the information was the Air National Guard wants good doctors, and you've got a great record. They invited me to St. Louis to just see the National Guard squadron there. I filled out the application while I was there and in a few days appointed to the National Guard. So after there for a few years, I was discussing with one of the higher ranking people in the National Guard who was in Washington, but visiting St. Louis. And he said to me, you know, you've done great work. He had gone through my record and he said, and you know, you're one of the people being considered to be in a group for promotion. Promotion at that time meant that it was a higher rank. So he said, there's one thing you don't have in your records, however, and other competitors in your group have. I said, what's that? You haven't been to flight school. I said, okay. He said, and everybody who's going to be competing with you will have gone to flight school and having a flight record will be an important part. So I was in my 40s. My oldest child was 14. I went to flight school and I got my certification and obviously I got promoted. And I am the first woman doctor to become a general in the history of the Air Force. And it was really interesting. I'm a brigadier general. I'm invited to give a talk someplace. And there were lots of people there. So the person introducing me said, and she is the first African-American woman to become a general in the history of the United States Air Force. So I get up to speak and I thank him for this introduction. And I said, yes, I was the first black woman physician to become a general. I said, but you know, my ancestry says that I'm 30 something percent white. So I guess I was the first white woman too. (laughs) Uh, So I love it. You know, there was a big roar, but I loved every opportunity and I worked hard at every opportunity. 
So when I was in the active duty Air Force, I was chief of the cancer center at Travis Air Force Base. So I made my application for research with the Northern California Oncology Group, got a, they said, one of the highest ratings of the applicants at that time. And I received a phone call from Air Force Administration saying, congratulations, but the Air Force cannot accept this funding from the National Cancer Institute. There is a law saying you can't transfer money from one area of the government to the other as a, they called it a gift, but it was a grant. So I call Phil Shine and I tell him about the situation. And he already knew that I had received a top report and he knew that I had the grant before I knew. So he says, well, let's see what we can do. Now, remember, Vince DeVita was the NCI chair at that time, and Dr. Rosenberg. At every ASCO meeting, Phil, Vince, and Dr. Rosenberg would get together, and they would bring their fellows. And Phil said, let me see what I can do. So somebody at NCI made some things happen. And I got this call from Saul Rosenberg. Edith, congratulations. So I said, well, thank you. But I didn't expect a phone call from you. And he says, well, there have been some changes. Your grant, the face sheet has been changed. I said, oh. Your husband again. I can't say who (laughs) or what, but it has Stanford on it. So. My grant went to Stanford. I'm sure they appreciated the the kick you got. But Dr. Rosenberg said, your grant is now Stanford. We're setting up an account for you at Stanford. And the funding goes to Stanford. So I had people working for me at the Air Force Cancer Center who were Stanford employees. Edith, there are still... Too few African American and particularly African American men in medicine. What's your perspective on that? So I think that many people are not given opportunities. And I've been concerned about blacks and other racial and ethnic minorities not entering medicine and particularly regarding oncology. So fewer than 5% of all practicing physicians in this country identify as Black, a little more than 5% Hispanics or people identify as Hispanic. And I've been trying to do something about that. So ECOG Akron has been very good about allowing me, and I set up with others, but I was the lead, a program for individuals. They could either be medical students, residents, fellows, or early faculty to attend ECOG Akron. And as a result of that program, we identified 12 individuals for each of the two ECOG Akron annual meetings. We bring people in And that has been a success. There's one person who I introduced when she was a resident. She then did a fellowship in oncology and is now in her first year as faculty. And we have students mainly from Tennessee State. I do maintain very close relationships with Tennessee State. And I have the first Tennessee State student who has just been admitted to medical school at Jefferson. So trying to work with them. As a result of my work with the National Medical Association and the International Myeloma Foundation, we have a group of medical students that have been mentored for oncology. Whether they will become oncologists, I don't know but they are all, all 12 are doing well in medical school. And with some anticipation, they might select 
oncology as their area of, of specialty. We set them up with an individual mentor, various oncologists around the country, and they have conducted research with their mentor. So I'm doing things that I think will be helpful to individuals. And I think we're not giving Blacks enough opportunities. Even in entering medical school, the number of Blacks entering most majority medical schools is still very low. Somewhere nine or 10 students per year, Blacks entering medical schools. And also, there has been a study conducted by the ACGME, which is the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, looking at graduate studies in oncology. Do you know that most of the oncologists have been trained at a few medical schools? And there are, I think it was 109 programs did not have a single minority student in the fellowship program. And that's terrible. I think that all fellowship programs should have some racial or ethnic fellows in their program. Yeah, one of the disturbing statistics that I've read from the AAMC is that the number of African-American men applying to medical school in 2023 and 2022 is actually less than the number that applied in that the 1970s. Correct. It's puzzling to me why we've not been able to attract young men into the medical profession. And perhaps it's because there's a sense of not being wanted or encouraged into the profession. More African-American women are applying, but even that number is small, at least in terms of the increase in what we've seen. Edith, you're, you're also the Associate Director of Diversity Affairs at the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center. What does the recent Supreme Court decision against Harvard in terms of admissions policy, how are you viewing that now at Jefferson? So I think that the Supreme Court decision certainly was disappointing, but it is what it is, and we've got to deal with it. That is the Supreme Court. So my suggestion and what I am telling students that they have to do, you do have the essay. So when I applied to medical school, I did not talk about Dr. Logan or my growing up on the farm or my parents not finishing eighth grade. But if I were applying to medical school now, I would use all of that background to include in my essay. And the Supreme Court didn't say that you couldn't include that information in your essay. It said the schools could not use your racial background as a part of the equation. But your letter is still there. And therefore, I would include all of that in the essay so that you do have an advantage. We've just got to be able to do what we've got to do, not put the university or the medical school at risk because of the Supreme Court decision. But there's nothing in that decision that says you can't include that information in your letter. I have one question. What career advice would you offer your younger self? If you could speak to your 30-year-old self based on your knowledge experience, what career advice would you give yourself? So the one thing that I did not do when I was about 30 years old, and I'm not sure I even knew about it, I think I could have done more in health policy. And the one thing that I have not done is become a White House fellow. And that's usually early in your career plan. But I think my research would have suffered had I done that. And I still say, I don't know that I made bad choices. No, you Not didn't make bad choices at all. <laughs> well, knowing you, Edith, you could have been a White House fellow and done everything else you did. And your yeah. husband did not make a bad choice either. <laughs> Evidently not. 
Edith, thank you so much for joining us. You've had such an incredible life and, and it's so rich and we deeply appreciate your spending time with us. I want to also thank all our listeners of Oncology, Etc., which is an ASCO education podcast. This is, as you know, where we talk about oncology, medicine, and, and everything else. If you have an idea for a topic or guest you'd like to see on the show, please email us at education at ASCO.org. To stay up to date with the latest episodes and explore other educational contact, visit education.asco.org. The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform. This is not a substitute for professional medical care and is not intended for use in the diagnosis or treatment of individual conditions. Guests on this podcast express their own opinions, experience, and conclusions. Guest statements on the podcast do not express the opinions of ASCO. The mention of any product, service, organization, activity, or therapy should not be construed as an ASCO endorsement.